uh, I apologize. I was un I was muted. <laughs> so I will repeat everything that I've said and start sharing again. Um, rookie error. So uh, welcome everyone to the to the another ISH, ISHR JMCC webinar. Uh, this is a special issue JMCC webinar on computational models of uh, cardiovascular regulatory mechanisms. And we've got uh, three guest editors of the special issue, uh, uh, Jeff Sorsman from University of Virginia, Ella Grandi from University of California, Davis, and Andrew McCulloch from University of California, San Diego. Uh, I, I leave it to you guys now to introduce the speakers and uh, hope you have a wonderful webinar. Okay, thanks so much, Deborah, and the JMCC staff for uh, making this webinar a possibility. Uh, today we have uh, four really excellent speakers. They're all authors in the recent GMCC special issue on computational models of cardiovascular regulatory mechanisms. Uh, so we really encourage you to read all the articles in this special issue as others that are going to be emerging soon. And so I posted a link to the special issue uh, in, in the chat. Um, and so for today's, uh, today's special uh, presentation, we'll have each of the four authors uh, present their uh, presentation. And, and then while they're doing that, uh, please post your questions in the chat, along with indicating the person that you're asking the question to, and then we'll uh, answer the questions at the end. So our first speaker is Stuart Campbell from Yale University, and his title uh, is Molecular Mechanisms of the Dilated Cardiomyopathy Associated Mutation in Tropomyosin 1, MAR. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. and. Uh... Uh, Ellie and Andrew for this opportunity to present and, and thanks to all for attending. So um, I elected to talk about an application of the computational model that was published in the special issue. Um, Jeanette Creso is my graduate student who did the um, vast majority of the work on what I'm about to show you. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our collaborators at Boston University and UMass Lowell that have also contributed. So our lab is interested in the inherited cardiomyopathies, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. This is um, uh, a cadaver heart, of, you know, a normal heart. Um, inherited cardiomyopathies can cause a hypertrophic phenotype in which the um, left ventricular tissue is dramatically enlarged. It can also, um, uh, there's inherited cardiomyopathies that are associated with dilation of the left ventricle, where the, the wall thickness may be normal or, or maybe slightly thin, but the LV chamber is greatly enlarged. And what's interesting is that um, in both cases, um, these are caused by sarcomeric mutations. And the question that we're trying to address here, or the goal that we've been striving toward, is creating a computational pipeline that can predict genotype phenotype. Um, based just solely on the uh, variant to a sarcomeric protein, uh, you know, whether it's going to end up in sort of a hypertrophic state or a dilated state. So that's, a, that's the long-term goal. What I want to share with you today is our efforts toward that goal. We um, focus our modeling on the cardiac myofilament system shown here uh, schematically. And what I'm going to tell you about today is our efforts just to really dig into um, variants in the uh, protein sequence of tropomyosin, which is, of course, uh, a key regulatory protein in the cardiac myofilament that uh, prevents myosin from binding until calcium binds to the troponin complex, which results in, in the movement of tropomyosin. Why tropomyosin? Well, it has uh, what you might consider to be the simplest of all structures if you're to just survey all of these different proteins. Uh, it's got a coil coil structure whose uh, properties have been extensively studied uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And so we thought that this was an excellent uh, sort of entry into uh, a predictive modeling pipeline. What I'm gonna tell you about today uh, has to do with this myofilament model that was published in the special issue. What I'm gonna show you is that we're gonna take the outputs of atomistic simulations, um, which result in inferred changes to this myofilament model I'll show you how we used in vitro motility assays um, that use this uh, tropomyosin variant M8R uh, in order to tune the model parameters and then predict and attempt to validate predictions of uh, a twitch contraction phenotype. So let's start just by talking about this model that's really at the, the core of, of what we're trying to do. This actually dates back all the way to, to my graduate work at UCSD with Andrew McCulloch. Um, there we uh, came up with the idea of a stochastic representation of the cardiac thin filament as a series of interlinked uh, regulatory units. Uh, 
And the idea is that we'll explicitly track the regulatory state of each regulatory unit and account for nearest neighbor um, interactions between them. So this is um, from a model that, that was sort of an update of this in 2015, where we began to uh, consider additional states of the thin filament that would include um, stochastic activation, even in the absence of calcium binding, which led to some interesting properties. Um, again, as, as I mentioned, the, the reason why we need an entire thin filament with 26 regulatory units is because of tropomyosin, tropomyosin overlap that causes these regulatory units to tend to switch between tropomyosin states in concert. What we've done most recently is to, um, to give additional biophysical and structural detail to this thin filament switch mechanism, where we now account for the fact that um, troponin I interacts um, in not one spot, but um, uh, evidently two spots with actin in order to keep this filament system switched off. And by the time you add those interactions, it, it uh, moves the model from six states for each regulatory unit up to 24 states as shown here. So um, it, it just as a summary, um, what we've been able to do is to add additional structural and biophysical detail in the hopes of, of making this model better at predicting genotype phenotype relationships. Relevant to what I'm going to be showing you today about tropomyosin is the uh, updated representation that we published in 2016 of the tropomyosin chain. So as I, I mentioned in the previous slide, tropomyosin overlaps by several amino acids uh, with each of its nearest neighbors, which means that as it shifts its regulatory positions on the surface of actin, there must be some sort of distortion or bending of the tropomyosin chain. In the model, we've boiled this down to uh, this sort of simplistic uh, spring model in which units next to each other that are in dissimilar states can be thought of as having uh, an increased potential energy, which then impacts the kinetics of switching on and off of the myofilament. So the effective chain stiffness is one of the two important parameters I just want you to keep in mind that we're going to be, um, to be modulating here. The second thing is to understand that we have uh, taken into account the energy landscape of a single tropomyosin sort of sliding across the surface of actin between its blocked, closed, and open regulatory positions. And so by, um, by taking account of that, we have the second parameter that we want to keep track of, which is the equilibrium uh, constant between the blocked and, and closed states. Um, so closed state concentration and steady state over blocked state. So our, our collaborators um, had done some work previously on MADR, and um, what they noticed was that uh, MADR was causing, uh, for molecular dynamic simulations, they saw that it was um, weakening the end-to-end -end bond of, of tro between tropomyosin, and, and it was also shifting this block-closed equilibrium. Um, when they looked at a regulated in vitro motility assay, what they saw was that, um, that it caused a loss of calcium sensitivity and also a uh, uh, a loss of that cooperativity in that curve, as well as a drop in maximum velocity. So uh, we assume going forward that we would need to decrease gamma and uh, decrease the, the block closed equilibrium. Uh, moving forward, instead of velocity, I'll be talking about force, assuming that at steady state, those are proportional to each other. So just moving quickly through this, we, we started with the data from the experiments and we fit the model to the, the wild type data. Um, and got matches in all three of these characteristic parameters. We then performed a grid search and found that there was a minimum uh, that corresponded with a, a fit to the um, sensitivity change and, and the normalized maximum force. And um, what we were then able to do is to make an independent prediction of the Hill coefficient. We saw that although it did not match perfectly with the data, uh, qualitatively it decreased in a, in a like manner. So we now had a, a parameter set uh, basically reducing the stiffness um, of tropomyosin by half and decreasing that equilibrium coefficient from 2.3 to 1.7 did a good job of representing MADR. So now the question is, how would these affect isometric twitch? We can feed a, um, a generic calcium transient into the model, and then we can dial in you know, these uh, parameter changes at full strength. We saw that that um, resulted in a drastic reduction of the uh, of the peak force produced by the um, um, by this simulated twitch. Uh, 
Of course, in a patient, that expression is, is uh, typically heterozygous. And so 50% uh, of uh, the, the application of those M8R changes um, showed a twitch that's, uh, that you can see there in green. So the question is, are those realistic at all? And I'm gonna fly through this just in the interest of time, but uh, we have a, a system where we can check the, the phenotypes in a, a twitching muscle. This involves um, induced pluripotent stem cells and deriving uh, cardiomyocytes from those and then placing those in a decelerized scaffold to form an engineered heart tissue. We can then um, express the M8R variant using an adenoviral vector. Um, we culture those for, um, for 48 hours in virus and then perform mechanical testing. You can see here, this just shows that we're getting a uh, good expression of the um, wild type and mutant proteins on their respective vectors. Now, what we, uh, what we saw was that uh, indeed the M8R uh, virus uh, or the, the M8R mutation to tropomyosin did reduce um, peak force. And that's sort of a summary of the other characteristics. Um, it reduced the normalized force time integral and uh, it also reduced the time from peak to 50% relaxation. The, the drop in force is seen there as a trend, although it, it did not quite reach uh, statistical significance. So there's good qualitative model agreement. Um, we wondered if we could get quantitative agreement. We went back and, and ran these uh, for many different expression levels since we can't be absolutely certain. It's very, very difficult to determine the precise uh, expression level that we got in experiments. Um, but we noticed that um, the area under the curve and the relaxation time, uh, as well as the peak force were all co-varying. And so we, we wondered, is there an assumed M8R expression level that simultaneously matches the measured changes in, in peak force, normalized force time integral and RT50? And so this is what those patterns look like in the model. These are those three parameters as a function of M8R expression. And um, here we've mapped onto there the percent changes as well as the uncertainty that we're seeing in experiments. And um, what we found is that there was an upper bound of M8R expression that could be assumed at about 40%. And there was a lower bound here uh, based on the RT50 at about 30%. And um, that is reasonable based on the, um, you know, the evidence that we do have in terms of protein expression. So in, in summary, um, just to sort of uh, summarize my conclusions here very quickly, it looks like this DCM mutation and MADAR uh, can be explained in terms of its effects by a loss of tropomyosin stiffness and a shift towards um, the blocked state of tropomyosin. And um, you know, this results in, in limited contractility uh, in response to, to calcium transients. And presumably this, these are ultimately the fundamental drivers of disease. So I, I hope I've been able to um, give you a, an idea of how we're using this myofilament model to harvest information from atomistic simulations and then uh, begin to make some, uh, some reasonable predictions about phenotype. So I'll leave it there. Just another thank you to um, to my collaborators, my graduate student, Jeanette Griso, as, as well as a shout out to the rest of my lab. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart, well done. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone, please put your questions in the chat along with indicating that you're uh, asking a question to Dr. Uh, Campbell and um, we'll go on to the next speaker. Yeah, so it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, uh, Monica Grabowska. Uh, she's now at Vanderb Vanderbilt University, but was at the uh, University of Virginia when she completed the work that she's going to present uh, that is entitled Computational Model of Cardiomyocyte ap ap Apoptosis Identifies Mechanisms of uh, Tyrosine Kinase Inhibitor Induced Cardiotoxicity. Yeah, thank you for that. So I'll be talking about a computational model that we use to investigate mechanisms of drug induced toxicity. Um, so a little background about the problem of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKI, and cardiotoxicity. TKIs are a relatively new class of anti-cancer drugs that were originally developed to minimize some of the systemic cytotoxicity seen with more traditional um, chemotherapies. Um, and that's because they're targeted to only um, inhibit certain receptor tyrosine kinases that may be upregulated in cancer. Um, however, one of the unintended consequences that emerged with TKI use is this issue of cardiotoxicity, um, which can manifest in a variety of different ways, whether that be heart failure, 
hypertension and cardiac hypertrophy or coronary disease and subsequent infarction. Um, however, the mechanisms mediating this, this cardiotoxicity remain largely unknown. Um, and that's related to a variety of different factors. So one problem is the multi-targeted nature of many of these drugs, um, which includes their intended targets, as well as often um, a multitude of other targets known as off-targets, um, as well as the complexity of the signaling pathways involved and kind of this unclear clinical picture of what this cardiomyocyte damage looks like, whether that be heart failure, hypertension, um, or other coronary disease. Um, but experimentally in cardiomyocytes, TKI treatment has been associated with oxidative damage and apoptosis. So the aim of this project was to kind of integrate these findings by constructing a computational model of cardiomyocyte apoptosis that would connect these drugs and their drug targets um, to these tyrosine kinase and intrinsic apoptotic signaling pathways in order to be able to predict how these drugs are working and whether or there are any therapies that could potentially mitigate this cardiotoxicity. Um, but this model was constructed using um, a logic-based differential equation modeling approach. Um, so what that means is that we're using a series of differential equations um, to model the activity of various um, elements in the network. And so we can see this dummy model here on the left-hand side where we have some entity A, um, which is connected with an AND gate to some entity B. So A and not B will activate species C. Um, and then we can observe kind of the fractional activation of species C in response to this um, activation by A and not B over time and kind of model how this network is changing. Um, so for the purposes of our cardiomyocyte apoptosis network, um, we were able to construct these um, series of reactions and define these species based on a literature search of the drug targets and known tyrosine kinase and apoptotic signaling pathways. And the model that we ended up constructing looks like this. So we can see here on the left-hand side, we were able to incorporate seven cardiotoxic TKIs, serafinib, sinitinib, panatinib, um, and others. And here on the diagonal, we have the receptor tyrosine kinases um, that they target. And for many of these, it's not a one-to-one -one type thing. One drug can target many receptors. And then we also have other signaling intermediates based on the signaling pathways that we identified um, in terms of ty tyrosine kinase signaling or intrinsic apoptosis signaling, but ultimately, we get an output of apoptosis and cell death. And altogether, we have 69 different signaling intermediates in our model um, involved in a total of 112 reactions. Um, but the interesting part of building this model is that we can then run um, drug perturbation simulations to examine how TKI treatment is expected to um, affect our model outputs and either result in apoptosis or cell death. Um, and we can see here that um, our simulations of serafinib treatment show upregulation of caspases three and nine, Bax and BAD, which are all pro-apoptotic proteins, um, and ultimately predicts apoptosis in response to serafinib, which is the likely mechanism for its cardiotoxicity. We can then run these simulations across all of the seven TKIs that we have in our model to examine if there's any differences um, we can see broadly that there, all of these TKRs um, are somewhat cardiotoxic and exert apoptosis, although there is a differential response with serafinib being the most um, pro-apoptotic, resulting in high upregulation of caspases three and nine versus um, nilotinib and erlotinib, which exert weaker apoptotic responses um, with lower level activation of caspases three and nine. Um, we also want to validate our model to make sure that um, its predictions align with experimental observations. Um, and we can see here, um, for example, that gifitinib is projected based on experimental observations to increase reactive oxygen species generation 
And that is what our model predicts as well. Um, although there are certain um, discrepancies. So for example, experimentally, erlotinib was suggested to have no effect on ROS, whereas our model predicts an increase in ROS. Um, but overall, the model um, is generally reliable, correctly predicting over 80% of experimental observations. And then another, um, beyond the drug perturbation simulations, another good simulation that we can run are these knockdown simulations um, to help identify negative regulators of TKI-induced apoptosis. So in these knockdown simulations, we're going through each um, kind of element in the network and setting its maximum activity to zero and then observing the change um, in all other species in the network when that knockdown is performed. In here, we can see that um, with serafinib treatment, if we knock down certain species, um, that can actually reduce the apoptosis that we would normally see with serafinib treatment. And that suggests potential targets for inhibition. So for serafinib, we saw that um, knockdown of ASK1, P53, and reactive oxygen species, among others, would result in decreases in apoptosis. And then we can zoom in on this right-hand side on some of the top negative regulators of TKI-induced apoptosis across the seven TKIs and see kind of what differences exist, what commonalities exist. But here we can see that, for example, knockdown of NOx um, results in decreases in apoptosis for the TKIs nilotinib and erlotinib, but not so much the other TKIs such as serafinib. And then from here, we can investigate these targets for inhibition and how they would affect the subsequent apoptosis that we observe. So here we can see that ROS inhibition can actually prevent against serafinib-induced apoptosis, um, which suggests the utility of an antioxidant such as N-acetylcysteine, um, which is commonly used that in kind of reducing the apoptosis in cell death that we would observe. There are some limitations to this modeling approach. Um, a big one is kind of the parameter set that we use. The model operates on a set of default parameters um, and those have been um, validated for robustness. So we've varied those default parameters and not seen large changes in how the model performs. Um, however, we do model the inhibition of the receptor tyrosine targets of the TKIs as a complete inhibition, but there is a potential chance that it might be a partial inhibition. And it's unclear how TKI off-target effects factor into this since we don't know a lot of these off-target effects right off the bat. But in conclusion, a computational model of cardiomyocyte apoptosis provides us with more of a network-based understanding for investigating these mechanisms that mediate cardiotoxicity. Um, our model is well validated and shows apoptosis in response to these seven TKIs that we are able to simulate with the strongest apoptotic response induced by serafinib. Um, and then furthermore, our simulations suggest that um, potentially inhibiting ROS, so reactive oxygen species with an antioxidant might help reduce some of this TKI induced apoptosis and cardiotoxicity. And I'd like to thank the Sosterman lab um, because I did this work there, but that's it for me. Thank you. Congratulations, nice work. Um, so just again, I remind you, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and um, those will be answered at the end. So on to the next presentation. Thank you, Ellie. Um, it's great to see so many familiar names on the participant list and uh, thank you to uh, Jeff and Ellie and uh, all our speakers today. Uh, our next speaker is my colleague at UC San Diego, uh, Dr. Padmini Rangamani, and the title of her talk is Computational Modeling Approaches to Cyclic AMP PKA Signaling and Cardiomyocytes. Padmini? Hi, 
Thanks, Andrew. So I did a bit of a speaker privilege thing and updated the my talk talk's title because I wanted to share something uh, that's relatively new that uh, is a collaborative work uh, between my group, um, uh, Bill Lauch at uh, University of Oslo and uh, the Simula program, uh, Maria uh, Jonas and uh, Kim McCabe, uh, who was a former uh, UCSD uh, bioengineering grad student. So what I want to talk about is actually um, how the spatial organization of our anodine receptors can affect the um, dynamics of um, calcium sparks. And uh, I'm very uh, grateful to the guest editors for inviting me to write a review because the timeline of this work is almost reverse. You write reviews after you've done some contributions in the field. Um, I did not work on cardiomyocytes before. I've done a substantial amount of modeling work and various aspects of signaling. Um, but writing this re the review with Kim uh, essentially opened up the avenue for this paper, which is what I want to talk about today. Um, so basically, just to get us on the same page, um, where we got started uh, on this work was while writing the review, identifying that uh, ryanodine receptor clusters on the sarcoplasmic reticulum actually are disrupted in a heart failure. And so here I'm showing you the schematic of a T-tubule and um, the intact cluster, and these receptors can be phosphorylated or not. And then in the case of heart failure, the T-tubule the structure is disrupted, but so is the uh, ryanodine receptor cluster. How do we know this? We know this because of super resolution microscopy showing the cluster uh, disruption. This was a fairly recent observation uh, three years ago. And so when, and there were predictions showing that the distribution of these clusters, you know, whether it was their sizes or shapes and things like that could change the calcium dynamics. And so when Maria started uh, working with Kim and myself uh, through the SURF program, we started asking the question, how much does this really matter? And can we build a controlled a sort of analysis of the sizes and shapes of these clusters using a computational model? Now, we thought that would be really a good starter project for a first year grad student, but I must tell you that it turned out to be significantly more complex as is always the case. Uh, what we did was um, set up, using the super resolution microscopy as inspiration, we identified five possible geometries. So what you're seeing here, the red, each red dot is an anodine receptor. And you have, a, we have basically mimicked a calcium release unit as a cube of these dimensions. And we now have five geometries of these clusters. So same numbers of receptors, but organized differently. So a near circular geometry as our control for the purposes of our discussion today, an elongated geometry, and then, you know, G1, G2 here are intact, but then you start to disrupt the uh, cluster organization. Right, so two things here now, shape of the uh, cluster and the integrity of the cluster, if you will. And this right here has multiple small clusters, uh, like heart failure, uh, literally. Then there's this question of phosphorylation patterns, which basically leads to, you know, how do you think about it? Do you just do a uniform phosphorylation of certain fractions or so 20% or 50%? Or do you just like it phosphorylate? And then does the location of the phosphorylated receptors matter? So the net result of what was supposed to be a let's just you know play around with this to get situated on these simulations resulted in uh, 40 combinations between the geometries and the phosphorylation patterns inspired by all the experimental literature. And then because these are stochastic simulations, which I'll tell you about in a second, 200 runs per configuration. So what we are really modeling is the dynamics of calcium in the cytosolic domain, where there are four uh, buffers for calcium, ATP, calmodulin, troponin, and FLO4, a standard reaction diffusion equation for the calcium and for the buffers. And in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have cal sequestrin as the buffer, and then again, a reaction diffusion equation. The coupling between these two domains is through the bound flux boundary conditions for ryanodine receptors, the phosphorylated ryanodine receptors, and circa. And these ryanodine receptors account also for the um, sensitivity of the rates in here, 
the calcium dependent sensitivity of the rates in here for the phosphorylated and the non-phosphorylated receptors. And the dianodine receptor open closed state is modeled as a stochastic model based on previously published work. Okay, so with that in mind, I'll give you an overview of these results and invite you to please take a look at the preprint on BioArchive. So if you compare the G1 geometry versus the G2 geometry and look at the key readouts that we want to compare against. The first that I want to show you is the sort of dynamics of the spark, okay? And then what we'll do end up comparing to, for the rest of the talk is the spark fidelity, which is basically um, say, asking, you know, if the fluorescence of the calcium exceeded by 30%. So delta F over F must be greater than 0.3. And then looking at the amplitude of the spark, looking at the time to peak. And what we found was that in, oh, and then I'll explain this in a minute. Uh, the G1 geometry versus the G2 geometry, the G1 geometry had a higher fidelity of uh, calcium spark dynamics as compared to G2. The only difference between these two is the org shape organization of these rarity receptor clusters. The amplitude of um, calcium dynamics was higher in G1, and the time to peak was lower. So the working hypothesis is that the disruption of clusters in any way, shape, or form can delay the uh, dynamics of calcium and result eventually in loss of synchronization. And what I'm showing you here is sort of first glimpses at how if you change the geometry of these clusters, everything else being the same, you are starting to lose the sort of dynamic fidelity. The other thing to note is that if you look at this histogram, in the G1 geometry, there were a number of simulations in which uh, you had all 50 dianary receptors open. Whereas in the G2 geometry, there were no simulations in which all uh, 50 receptors were open. And this kind of speaks to the sort of spatial organization of these receptors and the spatial diffusion of calcium and how it can impact the receptor opening because these receptors are calcium um, sensitive. And in this case, with unphosph all unphosphorylated receptors, we are starting to see that the compact circular nanoclusters can generate larger and faster calcium sparks than the elongated nanoclusters. All right, so then you can ask the question, uh, does the phosphorylation pattern matter? So if I take G1 and you know, remember that I can fully blanket phosphorylate everything, I can sprinkle 20% of uniform phosphorylation or uniform 50%, and then I can do inner and outer and all possible combinations. So what did we learn from a whole bunch of data here after analyzing the, running these simulations and analyzing them? So the first thing I can tell you is that the uniform phosphorylation and the blanket phosphorylation don't have very dramatic differences. I'm not showing you the blanket phosphorylation here, but if you look at the um, first, point that I want to make is that how you phosphorylate these receptors um, spatially has a big impact on the calcium dynamics, whether you compare its uh, inner 20% or um, uh, inner 50% has a big impact on these. But if you are looking for higher fidelity, lower amplitudes, and longer spark durations, then inner phosphorylation is your best friend. Okay, so summarizing a lot of data here in sort of um, two very quick points. Then I go ahead and I can do this because it's a computational model. I break the cluster, everything else being the same. I'm just putting a spatial difference between G2 and G3. And when you break the cluster, you start to see that um, you are losing some of the features you're looking for. G the G3 has lower fidelity and a higher spark duration when compared to G2 simply by disrupting the clusters without changing the phosphorylation pattern. Now you can go ahead and make this more complex, disrupt the cluster integrity phenomenally. And when you do that, in fact, there are cases here, this is a panel C here is G5. There are cases where you barely ever get uh, channel opening and uh, firing. Whereas uh, you do get some uh, response in this G4, which is three clusters, but in G5, you barely ever get any. And so there are many simulations where you couldn't actually get um, 
calcium uh, sparks. So what this allowed us to do is actually look uh, at a very detailed interplay between cluster shape, integrity, and phosphorylation patterns. Like I told you, this was a very massive parameter sweep of um, many possible uh, combinations com combined with stochastic simulations. But if you take all of the data and assemble it this way, you can start to think about, if I look at uniform phosphorylation, for example, that's perhaps the easiest one for us to imagine. And you look at the fidelity, you can get, um, you know, if you're looking for high fidelity, you're looking at G1 as your most favorable cluster. But what happens when you have a disruption of clusters? G5 is not included here because I told you many of those um, simulations don't even show you a calcium spark. G4 has a much lower um, fidelity because you have disrupted the clusters. And, and so similarly, you can look at the same thing with inner phosphorylation or outer phosphorylation and arrive at conclusions on how um, you can tune this, one can think of tuning these behaviors as a function of these nanoclusters. Um, where we are going with this next is to think about skeletal muscle because of some papers that just came out earlier this month on dianodine receptor leak um, and skeletal muscle in the context of exercise and metabolism. And I'm very excited to continue this work with uh, Maria and Kim. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the funding um, that has supported this work and the SURF program uh, for Maria's PhD work. Thanks very much. Thank you, Padmini. Just a reminder to put your questions for Padmini in the Q&A and I'll hand back to Jeff now to introduce Seth. Nice job, Pamini. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so our next speaker is Seth Weinberg from Ohio State University. And uh, his talk, uh, I can't read it off the slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Mechanisms underlying age-associated manifestation of cardiac sodium channel gain of function. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff and, and Ellie and, and Andrew for uh, organizing the special issue and, and Daver for uh, organizing uh, all these really fantastic uh, symposia. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work today um, in our lab um, that's really been ongoing for, for many years now, looking at modeling uh, cardiac sodium channel gain of function uh, and the regulation of that gain of function. Um, this work in particular was done by a fantastic PhD student uh, in my group, Madison Novak, uh, who just recently defended a, a couple weeks ago, uh, as well as our uh, collaborator, uh, Steve uh, Polzing at Virginia Tech. All right. Um, so we all are hopefully familiar with, uh, you know, Cardiac arrhythmias are often triggered by dysfunction of, of ion channels, uh, defects in ion channels. And this work in particular focuses on a gain of function uh, mutation associated with uh, the voltage gated sodium channel, uh, NAV 1.5. Um, and we're, we're uh, interested in this particular because this, this mutation is associated with a disorder known as long QT type three or LQT3. Um, there's several different types of mutations that can lead to long QT3. Um, but the sort of general uh, common manifestation is that you have a prolongation of the ventricular uh, action potential. Um, and in all of these defects of the sodium channel, um, that's driven by uh, a, a very pronounced late sodium current um, that's not there uh, under kind of normal or, or wild type conditions. And this late sodium current um, prolongs the cardiac action potential, and this often manifests as these um, early after depolarizations or, or EADs. Um, so one of the things that we've often been interested in and, and really kind of drove our initial interest in, in studying long QT3 is it has a very complicated clinical manifestation um, in that it's often concealed in many uh, patients. So patients have the, you know, one of these mutations, um, but there's essentially almost no symptoms that manifest until uh, fairly late into life, 20, you know, into the 20s and 30s, and sometimes uh, often much later. And so this is this age dependence that we're, we're interested in, in trying to understand. Um, and in fact, sometimes patients with these mutations will be completely asymptomatic, including having completely normal QT interval. Um, so here's an example of one clinical study that followed patients um, as a function of age and their probability of having some type of cardiac event. And uh, even patients that have a normal QT interval have uh, an increased probability of having a cardiac event. And often the first symptom for these patients is sudden cardiac death, right? So it's, it can often be very lethal because the, the patients essentially don't know they have this disorder um, because of this you know, asymptomatic presentation. <clears throat> 
Um, and so, you know, when we started thinking about this, this, this got us thinking about what are some potential, you know, uh, reasons why these patients could be potentially completely asymptomatic. And one of the things that we, um, you know, can observe from the literature is that when you look at isolated myocytes that have this defective sodium channel is that these EADs and prolonged um, action potentials are often fairly reproducible, but in intact tissue, um, it's much more rare. And then again, patients can often be completely asymptomatic. So that suggests that there's some differences um, related to cell-cell coupling, right? Because that's the main difference between an isolated cell and, you know, intact tissue. And so in general, this motivated taking a closer look at perhaps this relationship between sodium channel signaling and cell-cell coupling. Um, and so one of the kind of really key pieces of information that we, we know about that relationship is that sodium channels in particular are known to actually cluster at the site of cell-cell junctions around both gap junctions uh, and mechanical junctions. And so this is some various uh, immunohistochemistry and, and super resolution imaging, looking at the clustering of, of NAV1.5, with either connexin 43, main, uh, a main gap junction protein, or um, n cadherin, a, a primary mechanical junction protein. And all of these studies find that you know, at these regions of cell cell junctions, sodium channels and um, these junctions cluster. And essentially, what this does is this places these sodium channels adjacent to these very narrow spaces between cells, um, which we call the intercellular cleft. And this space is often on the order of tens of nanometers. And what our work ultimately will find, and I'll show, is that these narrow spaces end up being very, very critical for the regulation of uh, sodium channels. Um, and in particular, this also connects with these age-associated changes that are, that are also, at least we think, are, are relevant to this regulation of the sodium channel defect. And so what we know is that these, this, this organization of sodium channels clustering at the cell-cell junction, um, the intercalated disc, uh, changes throughout development. Um, so at early developmental stages, we know that the sodium channels are fairly uniformly distributed, um, similarly to both the gap junctions and then canherin. And then with you know, development, these, all of these proteins begin to cluster at the cell-cell junction, but with very different time courses, right? The, the mechanical junctions tend to cluster at the, the cell, uh, cell junctions early, followed by sodium channels, and then ultimately followed by um, connexin 43. So it suggests is perhaps that this you know, connection between the age manifestation of the disease is perhaps at least connected with this age manifestation of the organization of the proteins. And that's really what this work you know, sought to, to try to understand. Um, and so one of the, the key pieces that we had to do was to develop a, a computational model um, that could potentially answer some of these questions. Um, for the interest of time, I won't really be able to go into all of the details, but what, really one of the key pieces is that we had to modify kind of the typical way of, of um, modeling uh, cardiac electrophysiology, um, which typically represents, you know, one cell with, you know, many ion channels. Um, but we needed to have some way to represent ion channels clustering in different regions of the cell. And so we essentially adapted a model um, that was uh, originally developed by Jan uh, Kuchtera um, that essentially allows to account for these aphactic uh, interactions that happen around that intercellular cleft space. And so what we do is we essentially discretize the cell into multiple membrane patches where we have ion channels both along a lateral membrane as well as at the site of cell-cell junctions. And then there's this intercellular cleft space where those currents are able to interact. We also had to incorporate a model of this long QT3 mutation, um, as well as account for sodium uh, chan or sodium concentrations um, being dynamic in this intercellular cleft space. And we have several papers now that have used this uh, model, so you can you know, look into those for, for more details. Um, and so what our, our first work using this model essentially uh, was showed was um, that we, we sort of looked at uh, simulations incorporating this model under both conditions where we have a wild type sodium channel and then also change essentially the width of this intercellular cleft space. And so here we're showing the voltage, the sodium channel open probability, sodium current, and then the reversal potential at, uh, uh, at the extracellular uh, or in the uh, intercalated disc. And this is in this one dimensional chain of cells and we're just showing two different sites just for clarity. And so under wild type conditions, things look fairly normal. We have a, you know, a normal cardiac action potential. Um, for both the case where that cleft space is wide, as well as when it's narrow. We see very little changes, except for the fact that there's kind of this transient change um, at the reversal potential for the, uh, for the sodium channels. But in general, the action potentials essentially look the same. 
However, when we incorporate this sodium uh, channel mutation, we see we get this very pronounced prolonged uh, action potential um, and these EADs. And what's essentially we, we see here, the sodium channels are open longer. They have this pronounced late sodium current. And this is kind of the manifestation I talked about in the beginning. And this is for the case when that cleft space is relatively wide. However, when it's relatively narrow, we see that the action potential is essentially goes back to the same duration as the normal action potential. Um, despite the fact that there is the sodium channels are open and there is this smaller late sodium current. But what essentially we see is that there's actually this negative feedback mechanism that gets engaged where this late sodium current causes a transient depletion of the sodium concentration, which causes a, a drop in the reversal potential which decreases the current, which essentially terminates the, the EAD, right? So there's this mechanism where the, the width of the cleft regulates whether or not they have this EAD. And so this, these earlier studies showed that the cleft width was really this key determinant of EADs in adult myocardium. And so the work that we wanted to follow this up with was to see if we now incorporate changes associated with age, can we also predict this age dependence that we see in the clinical presentation of the, the disease? And so that's uh, this work, again, that was really spearheaded by Madison. And so the, the key kind of, you know, uh, uh, the elements that we needed to incorporate were, were various properties that we knew changed with, with development or, or with age. And so we really focused on essentially three different properties, the, the size of the cell, the density of the sodium channels, as well as this localization, how polarized are they, um, either being distributed more uniformly or more polarized at the ends of the cells. Um, and so one of the things that we found that was kind of, you know, really interesting, but perhaps maybe obvious observation was that was that the cell size um, itself was actually a really critical property. So here we're just varying um, the size of the cell um, for, you know, cases that have the sodium channel mutation. And we see that as the cell size gets larger, we have more and more prolonged um, uh, action potentials and more and more of these EADs. Um, and so because this is a computational study, we can really, you know, try to understand these, these properties, um, you know, very broadly. So we essentially varied those three properties, the cell size, the, the density of sodium channels, um, the localization, as well as the, the cleft width. And we identified parameter regimes that are pretty consistent with either an early developmental stage or an adult developmental stage. And so for an early de developmental stage, we see um, that in general, the, the cardiac action potential is fairly normal for really almost all conditions, right? This, these are the conditions shown in the box here. Um, but then when we look at more polarized distributions where more channels are localized at the end um, that are more reminiscent of adult, we see a much you know, more dependence on the, the cleft width. Um, and this is really kind of one of the key findings is that so for these early developmental stages, there's very little dependence on the cleft width, very little dependence on where the, the channels are actually localized. And then as the cells develop, become larger, become more polarized, there's this additional mechanism that can regulate um, whether or not we see these prolonged action potentials that depends on the cleft width. And so for our last study, we actually modeled this progression of development from an, you know, an early neonatal stage up to an adult stage. And there's a little bit of variability because we don't know exactly how to model those intermediate stages, but kind of the key findings that we see is that in general at later developmental stages, we have this you know, pronounced uh, regulation by the cleft width due to that polarization of the sodium channels. But at neonatal stages, we see very little prolongation really for any conditions. Um, and so in summary, um, you know, this, this work, you know, using a computational model is able to identify this, this new mechanism of, of regulation. Um, in particular, you know, it, it you know, correctly predicts this age-associated presentation of, of, of arrhythmias and you know, more broadly implicates the role of sodium channels at the intercalated disc. Um, some future directions is where we really want to know how to model some of these structural changes with age in, in more detail, and so that's something we're working on, and more broadly using this type of model to identify new therapeutic targets related to the structure, not just necessarily ion channels. And uh, again, I'll, I'll note that this work was done uh, by, by Madison, as well as our collaborators, and uh, I'll thank our funding as well. And happy to take any questions. All right, nicely done, Seth. So, uh, so now we're going to uh, transition to the, the question and answer sort of period. And we're gonna just kind of try to rotate through the speakers as we can, and we'll kind of take questions as long as people are, are able to. Uh, um, so the, the first, uh, so I'll start with uh, 
uh, for Stuart. Uh, so the first one is from uh, Farid, and uh, his question is, uh, great presentation, Stuart. Could you comment about the pattern of mutant incorporation? Were they random or clustered? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Farid. Um, great question. We did flag tag uh, this protein, and um, I'm as surprised as anyone else that um, adding this flag tag did not seem to modify the, uh, the behavior. I didn't show those data, but um, that did allow us to localize it. Um, they show a striated pattern. I don't know that um, we, we have good enough resolution with our imaging technique to be able to, to say. Um, however, th there seemed to be very good co-localization with, um, with an actin label. And so the, um, based on that and what we know about the turnover of tropomyosin, it seems like um, that they were nicely uh, distributed into the thin filament. I see that Andrew has a question for Monica, so maybe Andrew, you can read it out. <laughs> yes, uh, Monica, I was wondering, and you alluded to this um, right in the middle of when, when I was writing my question about, you know, knowing the off-target effects of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so then I thought about the question a bit more and was wondering, um, because it's obviously a difficult thing to measure, might it be possible to design experiments to actually deduce what off-target effects of these uh, drugs would be um, by using the model? I think that's an interesting idea. I think when we modeled the primary or the intended targets, we just mined those from drug bank based on the data that they had available. Um, so we could either see if through further literature mining, if there are published experiments on off targets. But I think if we do know the phenotype, whether that be apoptosis or something else, then we could potentially like back predict if that makes sense on what those off target effects might be. Um, but I think that's just a future direction to take the model in, but very interesting for sure. Thank you. I'm gonna read a, a question for Padmini from Daniel Koch. Thanks for the great talk, Padmini. Oh, I just lost it, sorry. <laughs> it had to do whether you know that there is any experimental evidence on um, phosphorylation patterns, patterns of ROIR cluster. So um, thanks for the question. Uh, ROIR are known to be phosphorylated by CAMK2 and PKA, um, but there's also a lot of controversy on the role of phosphorylation. In fact, I found this gigantic review and a back and forth on the role of the phosphorylation and its impact um, on calcium spark. So I don't think it's, uh, so we know the kinases that are candidates for phosphorylation, but um, a lot of what we don't know are the specific patterns. So we decided that playing with the pattern. So when you look at the inner versus the outer phosphorylation, it's, it's you know, taking the computational license to say, let's explore what could be the possibilities that are uh, in play here. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question for Stuart uh, from uh, Daniel Cope asking whether it would be possible to use targeted proteomics to measure more uh, accurately the uh, ratio of uh, wild type to m 8 r tropomyosins. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, certainly something that we have looked into extensively with, with a couple of different collaborators. Um, it basically boils down to being much harder than uh, we had anticipated to do. Um, detecting, you know, quantifying the, the ratio of proteins when there's just that one amino acid difference um, really would put us at the limit, uh, at least of, um, uh, you know, what we're, we're aware of being able to do through our collaborators. So we are instead uh, beginning to pursue an alternate approach that would um, try to um, enable us to, to use Western blots to try and quantify that better. So just comparing the affinity of the specific antibodies that we're using to flag into tropomyosin um, in non-cardiac cells so that we're just dealing with um, the exogen, um, exogenously expressed protein. So we're, bottom line is we're, we're working on it. it. It turns out to be a much thornier issue than we initially anticipated. I mean, I suppose an alternative strategy would be to, um, by replacement, just overexpress um, the mutant tropomyosin to different degrees in this in your human cells, and then um, use the um, sort of mRNA expression as a as a surrogate. Right. <clears throat> that, that's also a very interesting idea, and you know, you could uh, run the models in parallel along with those 
um, they should vary in, in the expected pattern if it's, if it's realistic. I'm going to read a question for Seth uh, from Charles Chung. <clears throat> Seth, great work by your lab. You suggest that the cell-cell communication might be critical, but I'm curious if the membrane stress is important in modifying the cleft or sodium channel localization, as unloaded isolated myocytes would have less diastolic membrane stress than with it within intact tissue. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'm probably going to have a lot of I don't know to a lot of the questions I'm seeing. Um, I mean, the short answer is it, it certainly could be relevant, right? I mean, what what exactly does the, you know, the intercalated disc look like, you know, in the, you know, a, a contracting, you know, a heart, right, in a beating heart, right? What a, One of the things I didn't go through this in too much detail, but it's in, you know, several of our papers is that, um, you know, the model is very sensitive to, you know, the essentially that width that I talked about. And, you know, it, it there's been a decent amount of, of uh, electron microscopy that's, that's quantified those widths. And, you know, they're on the order of, you know, tens of nanometers, you know, potentially up to, you know, maybe a hundred nanometers in, in more disrupted states. Um, but what does that look like when, you know, these are, those, these are obviously static, static images. Um, what does it look like in the actual, you know, beating heart or, you know, how much are they changing, right? Is it 10%? Is it 50%? Is it, you know, 2%? Um, the short answer is I, I don't think anyone really knows. Um, kind of an interesting related question is, has come up, you know, in the context of like calcium signaling and, and T tubules. And I've seen some really nice work from Peter Cole's group that has, has done some, you know, they've, they've, they've done some work to try to essentially identify the, the changes in the T tubules at different stages of, you know, the cardiac cycle. Um, and, you know, it's perhaps not surprising that it, it's pretty dynamic. And so I think it's very reasonable that, you know, the intercalated disc is also pretty dynamic in terms of, you know, its, it's actual shape and structure during the cardiac cycle. Um, from a modeling standpoint, it wouldn't be too difficult to incorporate if we actually knew kind of what the, the time course was. Um, but the short answer is, I don't really, I don't know, but it's a great question and it's something we're interested in as well. I had a question for Padmini. Uh, so you, you really nicely showed that the spatial patterning of the rain receptors matters a lot to the calcium signaling. I'm curious about is what, what mechanisms do you think are that set in place the spatial patterning to begin with? Like how, how does it get to be that way? So I have a, a potential answer and then I have a bit of a speculation if that's allowed. Uh, so uh, I'll, sure. I think the, uh, with respect to RYRs, uh, there are some papers showing that junctofillin is also uh, quite uh, tightly cor correlated with the uh, cluster. So there could be a mechanism there. I don't think it's fully understood what helps form these clusters and retain their integrity. Uh, the, the speculative part of uh, where I'm going with this is uh, in, in the, a lot of the work that I've been looking at in dendritic spines and neurons, a lot of these receptors that are important for uh, calcium influx do cluster. AMPA receptors are a very good example. NMDA receptors uh, cluster on the surfaces of these. But these are plasma membrane receptor clusters. Um, and in a se separate work with Jin Zhang, we basically showed that um, ACAP can play a big role in the clustering of voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, which will then have a coupling between calcium cyclic AMP dynamics. So the, these two last pieces that I said are you know, completely different fields, a lot of speculation. So I think what my current thinking from a biophysical standpoint on what could cause these RYRs to cluster would likely be some sort of a scaffolding mechanism uh, not clear whether it's on the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum or on the uh, PM side, but something that would sort of bring these molecules together. But the idea that um, receptors that are uh, regulate that are important for regulation of dynamics can cluster is seems, seems to be more prevalent across fields. So that's that's what I have. It's more of a big idea rather than specifics. Yeah, thank you. And I, I had a question for Monica, actually. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. I was wondering whether you could grade the inputs in your model and, for example, use these graded inputs to study synergy uh, 
positive or negative interactions and um, of, of various tyrant, tyrant, tyrant kinase inhibitors, sorry. Uh, perhaps to, with the idea that if you activate, uh, but to a lower extent, several of them, you might reduce the cardiotoxicity. Yeah, and that's a really great idea. Um, in the current version of the model, we just have a one input when we're doing into that um, drug when we're simulating the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but there is potential to grade it. So it doesn't have to be zero or one, it can be anything in between. Um, and that was one thing that we had initially wanted to do was trying different combinations of drugs, um, but just hadn't got to yet. Thanks. All right, so trying to check, check which ones got asked and did not get asked. Anyone have? Um... There is a question uh, for Sarah. Go oh, go ahead, Jeff. Are, are you doing the one for Charles Chung? This one from for Seth for Charles Chung. It says, uh, Seth, great work by your lab. You suggest that the cell cell communication might be critical, but I'm curious if the membrane stress is important in modifying the cleft or sodium channel localization as unloaded isolated myocytes would have less diastolic membrane stress and within intact tissues. Yep, we have read this one. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you let me read the whole thing. Sorry, sorry. So I, I'll go uh, one uh, further, Farid Musavi Arami. Uh, very interesting presentation, Seth. Is it possible for the model to account for fibrosis, which definitely occurs with aging? Yeah, also a good question. Um, uh, so one, I went through kind of the details of the model pretty quickly. So one thing to sort of specifically clarify is, um, you know, at, at this sort of iteration, the model is essentially like a one dimensional tissue. So it's, you know, a, a chain or of cells. Um, and so we certainly could account for various aspects of fibrosis. Um, you know, potentially like coupling to myofibroblasts, which is, you know, one technique that's, that's been, you know, utilized to, to model fibrosis or just to have other regions of tissue that are, you know, uh, you know, don't uh, have, you know, active myocytes, but have, you know, some type of, you know, fibrotic tissue that's, that's either poorly conducting. It, it wouldn't really make sense to do that in like a one dimensional tissue, right? Because if you just had sort of one fibrotic spot, you know, propagation would just sort of fail at that one space. You really need to scale the model to two or, or, or three dimensions in order to really, I think, account for what's going on with, um, you know, fibrotic tissue. Um, from a formulation standpoint, it would be straightforward to, to, to you know, to take the 1D version to, to two or 3D. It becomes a, a big computational challenge. Um, one aspect that, you know, I at least briefly mentioned is, right, in order to uh, uh, account for the distributions of sodium channels, right, we, we essentially have to discretize the cell um, into multiple spaces. Um, and because of that, right, we essentially are able to simulate, uh, you know, propagation across the cell, which kind of adds like a new shorter time scale that normally kind of gets averaged over in kind of your typical two or three dimensional tissues. Um, and so it's, it would be possible to scale to higher dimensions. It just becomes a bigger computational cost. Um, it's still something we're working on, right? A lot of it is, is improving the numerical methods. Um, but, but your question is, is definitely something we're interested in doing once we have, you know, sort of a two dimensional version of this problem. What happens if we now start incorporating fibrotic, you know, regions, uh, you know, which we know occurs with age. And so it's a, it's a great question. And it's something we're, we're thinking about, but in short, we haven't done that yet. Andrew, you want to take one? Um, so I actually had a question of my own for Seth, which was uh, about whether the age-related changes in cleft thickness that affect effector coupling could be associated with age-dependent changes in expression of intercalated disc proteins. Um, and I was particularly thinking of ZO1 only because we haven't done some work on it, but um, there are obviously there's a lot of other proteins there that um, are thought to have 
both signaling and structural roles at the um, intercalator disk and closely associate with connexin 43. Yeah, also a great question. Again, short answer is I don't know, <laughs> um, but um, that's where a lot of our experimental work has been focused or really, you know, the work of my collaborators. Um, so I mentioned Steve Polzing and Virginia Tech. Um, we also work fairly closely with, with Rob Gordy, who in particular has looked a lot at CO1 as well. Um, and so they're in the midst of, of, you know, beginning to start acquiring some of these age-related uh, uh, measurements of, you know, of protein organization. Um, and even just changes in the cleft width itself with age, right? You know, at, at that next level, um, there really hasn't been any study um, that has looked at, you know, cleft width, you know, with age, with the exception of one study that looked at like a cohort of atrial fibrillation patients. This was from Steve, Steve Polzing's group, um, but it was a very different age kind of range, right? They were looking at AFib patients that were from, you know, 50 to 80. And there was a correlation with age. So with, you know, older you know, older patients had wider cleft spaces. Um, but this is a really different age range than we're talking about, right? We're talking more about developmental changes. Um, and so, you know, they're looking at some of that that uh, in, in, in animal models and we're in early stages of setting up some um, collaborations with, um, ch you know, children's hospital to start getting, you know, actual patient tissue from, you know, earlier developmental stages. Um, because, right, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge piece of the model and it's a huge piece of what we think is doing a lot of the regulation of the sodium signaling, um, but we don't really have great experimental data um, on it, but it's, it's really where a lot of our, the experimental efforts are focused. Thank you. Ellie, I think you had a question for Padmini that didn't get asked, is that right? Yeah, I guess uh, it was maybe more philosophical. I was wondering whether you have any idea about covariance of these two issues. You are analyzing both the spatial organization of the RYR as well as the phosphorylation patterns. Do you think these are independent variables or maybe they covary? So I don't think they're independent variables. I think for purposes of analysis, we have to separate out one thing at a time. It is very likely uh, with the uh, phosphorylation uh, kinases involved that they are actually correlated. Um, I have some very nascent ideas on how to explore that correlation, but I wonder, I haven't done that with Maria because I wonder if it's sort of pushing the limits of a model to now, you know, we can change things. So we need to do this. I need to think a little bit more about how to incorporate some of those things, but um, it's rarely, if ever, independent in these sort of complex situations. So I'm pretty sure uh, there is more complexity involved. But that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Dabra had a question from Monica. It was a really nice work, Monica. I was interested in, to hear your opinion on reducing ROS as a means of reducing cardiotoxicity. I recently read that increasing ROS, increasing ROS is also being considered as a novel targeted therapy for cancerous cells. In other words, these cells are more sensitive to ROS mediated damage. So increasing ROS is actually therapeutic. Uh, how does this tie in with your ideas? I'll, I'll take away the caveat. <laughs> yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, so there definitely is, I would say, a trade off between increasing ROS and then kind of trying to decrease it. I think some cancer therapies, so radiation, for example, actually kill the cells just by inducing apoptosis, whether that be by inducing oxidative damage and generating ROS. But with these TKIs in particular, they're not necessarily intended to work that way. They're intended to knock down cell proliferative pathways. So like EGFR um, leading to downstream cell proliferation versus inducing apoptosis. So it's not their intended means of action, which is why um, I think that reducing ROS could be a means of reducing cardiotoxicity, although generating ROS to induce apoptosis in cancerous cells is kind of another means of just treating cancer. But there definitely is a balance between the two and it's unclear how kind of ROS generation works in the context of these TKIs. I think we have the first uh, question in the Q&A box, actually there was an answer from, for Stuart from Farid Musavi Arami. Could you, a uh, great presentation, Stuart, could you comment about the pattern of mutant incorporation? Were they random or clustered? 
Yeah, so we I did get a chance to to address this. Um, it it looks like they're they're evenly incorporated. Um, I think there was a a different question from Charles Chung, um, about um, in terms of matching in vitro motility data. Yes, I don't think I got a chance to ask that one, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Charles was asking about, um, you know, he he uh, was was focusing on um, the in vitro motility effects of M8R or tropomyosin. When we attempted to, when we fit that with the model, we focused on the calcium sensitivity and a reduction in motility, and then we we left off the Hill coefficient to be predicted. Um, the in vitro motility assay showed the Hill coefficient of calcium activation for M8R as being one. In other words, no cooperativity at all. Uh, the only way to achieve that with the model would be to assume um, essentially an effective stiffness of zero for tropomyosin, um, which we we assumed would be would be pretty extreme. I think that there's um, this probably boils down to several caveats with that regulated in vitro motility assay, including the fact that uh, thin filament lengths are variable. Um, that's not something that you can control very well experimentally, and they tend to be um, you know, not match um, that sort of in situ uh, ideal that we were assuming. So <clears throat> I, I think that it's a good question that you raise. Um, I think it would be well worth it at some point to figure out how to do um, calcium sensitivity measurements with skinned fibers that are expressing tropomyosin m 8 And um, maybe we could, could drill down into that question. Um, we were, you know, we were happy to see at least a qualitative agreement um, that uh, the Hill coefficient was dropping, you know, it was moving in the right direction, even if it didn't go all the way to one. Okay, so it looks like we've got a couple of questions. The ones that I see remaining are a couple of ones for Seth. Uh, so this one also by Davar, uh, impressive work, Seth, really like it. Uh, your model is based on the idea that most NAV 1.5s sit on the intercalated disks, uh, but most, IF data that I have seen and generated myself in adult ventricular cells suggest that NAV1.5s are localized, NAV1.5s are localized in sarcolemal and T2 dual membranes. Does that change your conclusions dramatically? Yeah, also a really good question. Actually, before I jump into that, I'll, uh, well, Andrew just left, but I was gonna <laughs> briefly follow up on something, his question on ZO1. Uh, Madison uh, just sent me a message a few minutes ago saying that, I guess in the supplement of one of the papers, we mentioned that Z01 uh, does co-localize with NCAD uh, and here and during development. So I guess something about Z01 is known. Maybe I'll, I'll have to send Andrew a message on that. Um, so to Daver, to your question, yeah. So really good good question. And it's something we've, we've thought a lot about, um, again, in terms of, you know, we know you know, the imaging studies show that there is sodium at the intercalated disc, right, as well as on, you know, the sarcolemmal and, and T-tubule membranes, right? So the, the big question then kind of becomes, you know, how much, right, in, in all of those different regions. And so essentially in, in the model that are presented here, it essentially becomes a parameter in the model. Um, so, and so then, you know, a question of how sensitive all of these results are to that parameter is, um, fairly <laughs> sensitive, um, up into, I guess, a point, right? So, you know, we, we kind of considered extreme cases. So, you know, for the extreme case for the adult, we considered up to 90% of the sodium channels being at the intercalated disc, which is probably a bit too high, um, you know, based on imaging and, 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 and other studies, um, we see essentially very similar results if it goes down to about 50 or 60%, just the range of parameters narrows a bit. So it's not, you know, this doesn't absolutely require putting every single sodium channel at the intercalated disc. Um, with, with this model, 50%, you know, where it's about 50, 50 on the sarcolemmal um, membrane versus the, the intercalated disc seems to be about the threshold where some of these effects kind of start getting diminished. Um, one of the things that's interesting is, is we're, 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 essentially developing kind of a newer formulation of the model. Actually, the first version of that was essentially just published in, in general physiology a, a couple months ago, where we've essentially modeled the structure of the intercalated disc in even more detail. So we're actually modeling different regions within the intercalated disc that can have potentially different populations of sodium channels. And kind of that work, as well as, you know, kind of our, our ongoing work shows that 
essentially the effects that we see with sodium channel clustering become even more magnified when we account for kind of this more detailed structure. And so what I'm, I would speculate, although at this point, you know, I, I can't really say this with complete confidence is, is I think we'll see actually fairly similar results to what we, I showed here, but without requiring 90% of the sodium channels. I, I think, I think I would guess it'll probably be much closer to, you know, 50, 60, you know, percent and still see a lot of these effects because just the, the more structure we account for, just all these effects kind of just get magnified, um, which isn't really shocking to me, right? There's a lot of positive feedback mechanisms that are being engaged, right? And so, you know, if you engage them more, right, you don't necessarily need as much to kind of push them over the hill, so to speak. So um, it doesn't really change our conclusions. It maybe changes, you know, the parameter regimes where we kind of see these findings. Thank you. Oh. There is one remaining question for Monica uh, from Charles Chung. Uh, Monica, the, this works. Uh, this work sounds like it has great potential to provide mechanisms for cardiotoxicity. Question: It looks like the method might be applicable to other cardiotoxic drugs. Is there a specific input or output that was particularly useful, and or is uh, is there any caution about how we might apply a similar method for other other cardiotoxic drug classes? Sure, and that's a really great question. Um, I think that this method is definitely applicable to other cardiotoxic drugs. I think the tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, themselves sort of facilitated um, modeling in this way, just because they. Um, inhibit tyrosine kinase, um, yeah, receptor tyrosine kinases versus other um, chemotherapies, which may be cardiotoxic. So like doxorubicin is the one that I'm thinking of, um, which has pretty known cardiotoxicity, but it actually like intercalates into the DNA and that's how it works. So that would be um, a little bit more difficult to model and maybe not as intuitive, but definitely I would think that this could be applied broadly. <laughs> All right, and then we've got one more that I'm pretty sure that we didn't ask Seth uh, from Laura Summerfield. Uh, says, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, which parameters are mainly changed for the age part of your model? So mainly cell size, cleft width, and channel localization. And do we assume ECM deposition to increase the cleft width with age or are there other mechanisms with an effect on a much smaller scale with uh, still properly coupled with cardiomyocytes? Yeah, great. Oh, great question. Yeah, I kind of did blow through that. So you probably didn't miss it. Um, so you're right in the, the parameters that we mostly looked at changing with age, right? So cell size, uh, the channel localization, and then also actually the, the overall channel expression, um, which the, there's, I think, some evidence that sodium channel expression increases with age during those early developmental stages. Um, so in the paper, we essentially do like a full parameter study of, of all of those parameters independent um, as well as cleft width. So it's really like a four dimensional parameter study, essentially. Um, and then when we were, you know, trying to model essentially the progression from, you know, early to, to late development, you know, we sort of identified, you know, certain ranges for each of those parameters, you know, based on the literature as, as best as possible to kind of model essentially the progression. Um, and in that last figure I showed where there's kind of neonatal to, to adult, and there's kind of like a range that's actually modeling like the, the range of of conditions that we think are sort of associated with those intermediate developmental stages. Um, in terms of changes with cleft width and age, again, you know, that kind of gets to the, the earlier questions. We don't really know um, if those change with age. And so in the study, we essentially modeled different values for that cleft width, but with kind of the main finding being in those early developmental stages, the cleft width didn't really matter, whereas it really only mattered um, in the adult stage. And that's consistent with there being more channels near the cleft, right? So those, those are kind of self-consistent. So yeah, that's essentially how we kind of model all those relationships. All right. It looks like we have come to the end of the questions. Thank you all to the speakers. Anything, Ellie, you want to close with? Shall I? Yeah, thank you for the great presentations. Uh, thanks again, Jeff, for getting us organized to do this and Davor as well. Um, I guess, oh, happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, thanks everybody. It's been a, a nice session. I appreciate it. Nice job, all, all four speakers. Thank you.
Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Take care.